As I journey here mid the Zorland tears, there's a rainbow in the cloud. He will safely lead, I must have no fear. There's a rainbow in the cloud. Turning, if you will, to Galatians, the sixth chapter. Again, that is Galatians chapter 6. One of the most powerful principles uh, for the child of God is the ability uh, to examine yourself. The Bible in its evidence, as far as self-examination self goes, is pretty, uh, pretty overwhelming. In Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, uh, just the first four verses there, Paul says, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one, and the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Verse 2, he says, Bear ye one another burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 4, he says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let us more prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. I love what Paul says in verse 3. He says, for the conjunction there takes us back to the original thought. Paul says in verse 3 again, if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, again he adds this phrase, that individual deceiveth himself. Again, points back to verse number uh, 2 there, the practical direction uh, he has just given us uh, to be spiritual. So basically what Paul is saying is, in order for you to be spiritual, uh, you more or less have to be willing to examine yourself. And unfortunately this morning, uh, many do not want to examine themselves. Uh, once we examine ourselves, it causes us to uh, look at more or less the ugly things about ourselves uh, that we really don't like or we don't want to pay attention to. Uh, but in order for something to change, uh, we have to be willing to address it. In order for something to get better, we have to be willing uh, to admit that there is something wrong with it. A couple years ago, I was uh, watching a show on uh, television, and the individual went into the description of autopsies. And I just thought to myself, uh, that within itself would be a great sermon uh, to illustrate how autopsies uh, happen, but also uh, how we can make a spiritual application to that. When a loved one has died uh, and we want to know the cause of their death, a physical autopsy must be performed. And later on, when we get the results back, or when the person gets the results back, uh, they come to realize that uh, there could have been something to prevent that situation from ever taking place. But now that individual is gone and there's nothing we can do about it. But so much is the case this morning, we have an opportunity to perform a spiritual autopsy. And it may be found that once we look at our own lives, and once we look at our own individual lives and our walk with God, uh, we come to realize that there are some things that can be corrected in our own lives. That we can get up from that place of discouragement that we find ourselves in, and we can be the people uh, God wants us to be. I believe that life in the kingdom of God is a life where an individual has to examine self. And again, this morning, we must be willing to examine ourselves. When an autopsy is done, we have something that's called the five manners of death. The first is natural death uh, due to natural causes. The second is accidental. The definition says sometimes people harm someone and they did not mean to do so, but it ultimately leads to the death of another. And then we have homicide, where we uh, purposely try to cause harm to another individual. And then we have suicide. Uh, sometimes people uh, purposely take their own lives. And then when none of those, uh, when none of the deaths can be classified in one of those four categories, we have this fifth category uh, that is known as undecided. I want you to hold those five different deaths in your mind 
because toward the end of our sermon, we're going to make a spiritual application. Again, the natural death, the accidental, the homicide, the suicide, and then the undecided. Again, many within the body of Christ have lost their zeal. It's amazing how when an individual is first is baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, it's almost as if we can't keep them out the church building. What happens to an individual when they lose their zeal, when they lose their focus, when they lose their commitment they once had to God? Well, the spiritual autopsy provides us an opportunity again to answer that question. Why don't members come back to services? Why don't members pray to God? Why don't members love and forgive like we ought to? Again, the spiritual autopsy, again, affords us the opportunity to investigate. Uh, number one this morning, again, you must be willing to examine yourself. Uh, you see, the great thing about the spiritual autopsy is you get to examine your own self. You get a chance to see what it is that is causing you to be sick. You get to see what are those viruses that are actually hindering you from serving Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 28, Paul says, for let a man examine himself, the context there, there being the Lord's Supper. But the Greek word there, for let a man examine himself, the Greek word there is dokumazo, and that word simply means to test. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul uses a different Greek word. Again, Paul says, let a man examine himself, but that word in 2 Corinthians 13, 5 is peruzo. And that word means to endeavor. That word means to scrutinize. We have to get to a point where we have to examine ourselves. And again, for many people, that's a very difficult thing to do. I'm basically telling God I'm willing to test myself. I'm willing to scrutinize myself. And again, many people do not want to do that. So often we love to have the spotlight on someone else. We love to highlight what someone else's problems and faults are. But in order for this spiritual autopsy to work, you have to turn the spotlight on yourself. I find it amazing that when the Bible says, examine yourself, we always bump the person next to us and say, did you hear what the preacher said? When the verse says, examine yourself, one of the best things you can do for yourself is to examine yourself. You see, when you look at the Bible, the Bible is more or less a mirror, and the mirror lets you know what's on the other side. The Bible talks about in James 1, beginning with verse 22, Let us not be a hearer of the word, but a doer, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man who beholdeth his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth his faith, goeth his way, and straightway forget what manner of man he was. Verse 25 says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, him being not a forgetful hearer, but a faithful doer of this word, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. The Greek word there in James 1, verse 25, where James says, Well, people, James says, But whoso looketh, that word means parakuto. And if you want to know what that word actually means, John gives us a description of that in John 20 and verse number 5, where the Bible says, Peter outran John to the sepulcher, and the Bible says, and he stooping down and looking in. Basically what James is saying is, James is saying is, but whoso will stoop down and take a real investigative look into the word of God, this man will be blessed in his deed. You know, it's almost foolish to get mad at the mirror for just pointing out what's in the mirror. It's almost impossible, and it really doesn't make any sense to look in the mirror and to get upset with the mirror and tell the mirror, you know what, I really don't appreciate what you're showing me. When the mirror only shows you what you're presenting to it. The same is true with the Bible. The Bible is only going to show you the flaws in which you have within yourself. And again, for many, uh, they don't want to look at themselves. Uh, many believe they are already too blessed to be stretched. They're too they're, they're, they're anointed to the, uh, 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 they're too anointed to be disappointed. All the cliches we hear in the world today. Many believe that they are on the front row seat, just heading toward heaven, when they themselves have not investigated themselves. 
James says you are stooping down into the word of God. You are testing yourself. You are scrutinizing yourself. And the Bible is going to only reveal who you really are. We must be willing to examine ourselves. But we also must be willing to allow ourselves to be examined by others. I can't even count how many times I've heard people quote Matthew 7 and verse number 1. Judge not that you be not judged. You know what? If I got a dollar for every time I heard that verse. Judge not that you be not judged. When those people fail to realize that context is judging. Matthew chapter 7, 1 down to verse 6. The context there is an individual judging you. We must be willing to allow others to judge us. Jesus himself in Luke 23 verse 14 allowed others to judge him. Now you may say to yourself, Josh, that doesn't make absolutely sense. You know what? It really doesn't make that much sense to me. Why would Jesus, who is perfect, allow others to examine him? But shall our Lord be examined by men even though they couldn't find any fault in him? Even though he was perfect, he still humbled himself and allowed them to examine him. Shall our Lord come and be examined by men and we not be examined as well? Uh, not saying about uh, those who just uh, try to look at all our faults, try to tell us everything that's wrong with us all the time, but for those who really love you. If it's one thing our world doesn't take good at it, it is constructive criticism. I'm not telling you something to make you feel bad. I'm telling you something so you can ultimately get better. The psalmist asked God in Psalm 51 to search his heart. What an attitude David displayed. God, I want you to search me so I can improve. God, I want you to show me my flaws so I can get better. And that's where the preaching of the gospel comes in. Because when you read the Bible and when you study the Bible, the Bible more or less looks you right in your eyes and tells you, hey, this is what you're doing wrong and you need to improve. You need to examine yourself. Will you just love that attitude? The attitude, God, I want you to search me. God, I want you to look at my heart and tell me what can I do to get better. And so often, people don't want anyone to search them because they're hiding something. But the psalmist said, God, search me, O oh God, because I want to know. When you are dead physically, someone else will have to order the autopsy for you. But if you really want to know where you are in your relationship with God, you have an opportunity to examine yourself. You see, you may have people who don't know much about the Bible. You may have people who don't know much about what they have to do to be saved from their sins. But those people more or less know what it is to do right and what it is to do wrong. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 13, Jesus talks about a broad way and a narrow gate. You are going to make a decision. You are going to look at these gates and say to yourself, either I'm going to go into the place that leads to eternal life, and I'm, or I'm going to go into the place that leads to eternal destruction. You know, God's people have always been in the minority with issues on spiritual matters. As I often study and read, the only two times I can read about God's people ever being in the majority is when Adam and Eve were in the garden, and when Noah and his family got out the ark. When you notice just those two times, compared to all the other times humanity has lived, God's people have always been in the minority. But you know what? That's okay. Because as I heard one preacher say, God plus you is always going to equal the majority. There is a broad way and there also is a narrow way. And then many say, I don't want to be judged. Some are harsh and their judgment towards others. And they themselves fail to realize that someone too had to examine them. If you want to be better, if you want to get better, you have to be willing to allow yourself to be examined. You have to first of all allow yourself to be examined by others. You have to allow yourself to examine yourself and then ultimately you have to allow the God of heaven examine you as well. You know, the eyes 
can say a lot about us. It's amazing that when you look at the eyes of an individual, it pretty much tells you everything you need to know about that person sometimes. I say that because in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, the Bible says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and doth rust corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor doth rust corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Then he asked this phrase, the light of the body is the eye. And therefore thy eye be single. The whole body shall be full of light. But if thy eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. And therefore the light that is in thee be darkness. How great is that darkness. The eyes are a great communicator. The Bible talks about in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 and 8. We looked at that verse this morning. God commended his love toward us and that while we were sinners, he died for us. 1 John 4, verse 19 says we loved him because he first loved us. John 15, verse 14 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Some are dead because the love they once had for Jesus is no longer there. Secondly, this morning, many are dead spiritually because they are not motivated by Christ. Their heart is not in it for the right reasons. Paul says in Ephesians 3 verse 4, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Paul knew these people would have to get out of the world in order for God to really bless them. Ephesians 5 verse 17 says, you can understand the will of God. It's just like when you're having a Bible study with someone and they're going back and forth with you, almost trying to convince you that you don't know what you're talking about. Trying to convince you that God has given us a book we cannot understand. But why would God give us something we can't understand? Why would God give us a book that talks about one church, but the world is determined to make it 52,000? Paul says you can understand the will of God. In order for you to know the will of God, you have to go to his will. You have to go to his revelation. But again, people in their hearts simply neglect the word of God. It could be this morning that the autopsy report shows us that our hearts are no longer in it as they once were. And it is imperative that we protect and guide our hearts. Again, James says in James 1 verse 25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. The Bible records for us over in Mark chapter 7, beginning with verse number 20 down to verse 23, Mark records these words. And he said, That which cometh out of the man that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart, the man proceeded evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, see, lasciviousness, and an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile the man. The very thing God wants us to put on, 2 Peter chapter 1, 5 to verse 8, love, goodness, brotherly kindness, are the very things the devil despises. Wouldn't it be great if when the devil looked at our hearts, he saw the love we had one for another? If he saw the willingness in which we had that we were going to forgive this person no matter what, we were going to love this person through everything, the devil might say, you know what, I want, I want nothing to do with that person. Well, if the devil examines your hearts and he sees greed, all he's going to do is take what you love and expose it. Why was Judas such the perfect individual for the devil to use? Because he was a greedy man. Judas was greedy long before the devil ever got to him. And if you are greedy, the God has a way of exposing that as well. That intellect gives us the will to understand God's mind. Emotions give us the proper action to understand his will. If you are going to protect your heart, you need to be careful what you allow into your heart. You see, eventually, the more we indoctrinate ourselves with things 
that need not to be there, eventually they're going to come to fruition. After a careful examination of ourselves, we find that many are dead due to natural causes. Many are dead due to natural causes. You know, I find it sometimes that uh, members of the church, we sometimes listen to false teachers on TV, on the radio, and I've even heard a member of the church talk about one time how great of a speaker that individual was. Do you know what? Well, there are too many great gospel preachers today who we can listen to. Truth be told, many of us don't know enough truth to be listening to error. God allows us again to examine ourselves. Again, we find many are dead due to natural causes, given over to things of this world. The Bible talks about in Romans 12, 1 and 2, verse 2, Be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When we look at the spiritual autopsy report, we find that many are dead due to suicide. Simply, sometimes many harm themselves, spiritually speaking. Many are dead due to homicide. Sometimes we say something to people where we intentionally try to hurt them. That's not the Lord's way. Again, in Galatians 6, Paul says, If any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Many will harm others, and it will cost them their lives spiritually. We can have such a bad attitude that it can affect someone else, and they never come back again. I'm sure many of us have had to work with people who have had a bad attitude. And every time you see the person coming, it's almost as if you just put your head down and start praying. It's difficult to work with people who have a very bad attitude. Many are dead from accidental death. Sometimes people die spiritually and they were offended. The people who offended them didn't even realize that they offended them. People leave the church and you go and try to talk to them and ask them what took place, what happened. They can give you an answer. They left, and they never told us why. And then finally, we have some who are dead spiritually, and we don't know why. We may even say this morning, some are dead, and they don't even know they're dead spiritually. They leave the church, and we reach out, and we ask them again, what happened? And they say, I don't know what happened. Did anyone offend you, hurt you? Is there any way we can make this right? They say they don't know. It's as if the person just woke up dead, spiritually speaking. But the great thing about God is he allows us an opportunity to always examine ourselves. He allows us an opportunity to look into the perfect law of liberty, James 1 verse 25. And again, the Bible is only going to show us what we are or not doing. It doesn't matter who you try to blame it on. It doesn't matter what you say the person did to you. We need to get up and make it right with God. But it will never happen if you aren't willing to have the spiritual autopsy. God allows us to examine ourselves. God allows us to look at ourselves in the mirror. And again, the Bible says one more time over in Galatians chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 6, beginning with verse number 3, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But he says in verse 4, But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. But that will only happen if we're willing to examine ourselves. You may be here this morning, and you may have not examined yourself. You may have asked yourself over and over again, what is God trying to do for me in my life? What is God really trying to lead me? Where am I trying to go with God? Well, if you look in the Bible and you examine yourself, we can find some of the answers to those questions.
We first encourage you this morning to be willing to hear what God has to say concerning your soul's salvation. Paul says in Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We must be willing to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. Being willing to confess him as Lord, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Being willing to repent of our sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. And thus, being baptized, the eunuch said, here is water, what does it hinder me to be baptized? And the preacher said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The Bible says, those two men, the preacher went down and baptized him for the forgiveness of your sins. That man in Acts chapter 8 examined himself with the preaching of the gospel. And we encourage you this morning to do the same. We invite you to come while we stand and while we sing. Oh, to Jesus I surrender.